What's going on guys, my name is Matt and it's been a bit but I'm back with a custom build featuring used parts. I did a $300 build in late November to show you what performance you could get with $300 buying all new parts. And in this video, I'm going to show you what you can get with $300 if you're willing to buy some of your parts used. Just to give you a quick comparison, the new parts $300 PC plays Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p medium settings with an average FPS of 76. Compare this to the build I'm showing off today, which in the same game at the same settings receives a nearly 200 FPS average. This is a huge boost in performance. Now this video isn't meant to be a guide on how to put this exact PC together. It's more meant to show you that if you're willing to buy some of your parts used, then you can get some insane performance, especially at this price point compared to all new parts. Now obviously there are going to be some downsides to going with used parts, which I'll go over in this video, but the fact of the matter is there's some great deals to be had, especially if you're willing to do a little deal hunting. Now this isn't the absolute best I could have done. I did some deal hunting, but most of these parts I got for their normal going rates. With that being said, the system still provides great performance in any game you throw at it in 1080p. Going into this, I had a few goals, the first being that it needed to outperform the $300 new build, otherwise what would have been the point of going used? Secondly, it needed to be upgradable. One of the main selling points of the $300 new build is there's a lot of potential for upgrades, and I wanted the used build to be the same. Finally, I wanted to make sure every part was of decent quality. I didn't want to compromise the safety of the system just to save a few bucks. With all this in mind, I began to select parts to go into this PC. I began by searching for a CPU. I looked at a bunch of older Intel CPUs because they provided good value for the money, but I kept on entertaining the idea of trying to fit a Ryzen CPU into the budget. While the Intel CPUs were tempting, they really were a dead end platform wise, so I decided to do everything I could to make this a Ryzen based system. Because new Ryzen 5 CPUs have been dropping in price a lot, it means that used Ryzen 5 CPUs are too. Now after looking over prices of used CPUs, I knew a Ryzen 5 1600 was out of the question, but the Ryzen 5 1400 was going for about 30% less and would provide similar performance in a lot of games. I ended up getting a Ryzen 5 1400 with cooler used for $60. This was a pretty good deal considering this is a 4 core 8 thread CPU running on a relatively modern platform, and actually if you spend $10 more you can get a new sealed R5 1400 with stock cooler off of AliExpress. I was fine with buying this CPU used, but that may be the better option for some of you out there. Like I said before, this is a quad core CPU with hyper threading making it a great CPU for gaming. It's not super fast, but with the stock cooler and an overclocking supported motherboard you can actually give this a mild overclock very easily, which is something I did and will talk about later in the video. Overall, for $60, the CPU is a bargain and its price to performance is a direct result of AMD's innovation over the past few years. To cool the CPU, I'm using the included Wraith Stealth Cooler which does an adequate job of cooling this quad-core chip. It's a pretty basic hunk of aluminum with some fins and a 92mm fan attached to it. With that being said, I love the AMD stock coolers. These guys look great in my opinion and unlike Intel, AMD gives you an adequate stock cooler for each SKU of CPU. Even something like the 8 core 3700X comes with a very capable stock cooler. All in all, the stock cooler gets the job done and came with the CPU for free, so using it was a no brainer. Moving on to the motherboard, this was a place I had to do the most hunting. I knew I wanted a B450 or B350 board because those boards supported overclocking and generally are more feature rich than their A320 counterparts. After watching listings for a few weeks, I ended up getting an MSI B450M Pro M2. Well, this does have Pro in the the name, in reality it's one of the more basic B450 boards on the market, but the price I paid made it well worth it. I got this board for $43 shipped, which at the end of the day is a pretty good deal. This board is basic, but it has all the features we need and fits all our components just fine. It has a decent I.O. layout, a 16x PCIe slot for our graphics card, and even an M.2 slot. Some of the not so great things about this board include the less than desirable VRM setup that isn't being cooled by any heat sinks, and this board only has two dim slots for our RAM. This means that because I went dual channel for this build, if I want to upgrade in the future, I'll need to remove this kit to do so. This is unlike boards with 4 slots which are much more RAM upgrade friendly. Speaking of RAM, let's go ahead and talk about what memory I used for this system. 16GB was a little too much for the budget I had, so I had to go with 8GB. I knew I wanted a 2x4GB kit because dual channel memory provides immense performance gains over single sticks. I also wanted a relatively fast RAM kit because speed 
speed also has a big impact on Ryzen's performance. What I went with is actually the same kit I used in the new parts gaming PC, which is a 2x4GB kit of G-Skill Ripjaws DDR4 RAM at 3200MHz. This is plenty fast for the build, and at around $40 it fits into the budget fine. I definitely could have deal hunted more for the RAM, but I decided to just use what I had on hand at the time. 8GB is plenty for esports games, but in more modern AAA titles, 8GB does start to become limiting. If you have $20 more to spend, then going up to 16GB of DDR4 would be a very good idea. With all that being said, 8GB worked fine in all the games tested, so I'm content with the RAM choice. For storage, I ended up doing what I usually do for builds around this price, which is to buy the largest capacity SSD the budget will fit, and recommend upgrading to more storage in the future in the form of a hard drive or another SSD. I do this because having an SSD provides a much better experience in using the computer, boot up times are faster, program loading times are faster, and it makes the computer feel more snappy overall. What I went with is a 240GB Inland Professional SATABase SSD for a little under $30. For this price, you're getting a relatively basic drive, but again, even this will be miles better than a hard drive. 240GB is plenty for your OS, applications, and some of your most played games. If you absolutely need more than 240GB to start out with, then you can get a 500GB hard drive for around the $30 price point. But again, I would highly recommend starting out with an SSD. For the graphics card, I went with what is probably the best price to performance used graphics card out right now. This is an AMD RX 480 with 4GB of video memory. I didn't feel like going up to the 8GB model was worth the extra money, because even though modern games are starting to take up well over 4GB of video memory, that usually only occurs at very high settings, whereas 4GB should be plenty for modern games at 1080p medium settings. This is the MSI Armor version of the RX 480, which is probably the most basic design-wise of the 480s. It's a dual fan design, and while not impressive, it definitely gets the job done. I got this one for $75 shipped, which is a pretty good deal, and a deal that did take a few days to find. Using it the way it came was producing temps in the mid to upper 70s with almost max fan speed, and with new thermal pace, the temps dropped 5 or 6 degrees and the fans became much more quiet. To do this, all I had to do was remove 4 screws on the back, pop the cooler off the board, clean the old thermal paste on the die and on the heatsink, apply new thermal paste which I personally like to pre-spread on bare processor dies, and finally, just push the cooler and board back together and reinstall the four screws. This is something I would recommend doing on any used card you buy, and even something you can do on your current GPU which can improve temps and fan noise if the thermal paste application is more than a few years old. For the power supply, I ended up going with an EVGA 600 watt 80 plus white unit. I used to be able to get these super cheap around a year ago, but this one I got from EVGA B stock for $30 which is a decent deal. This is a refurbished unit, but most of the time you receive a refurbished product from EVGA B stock, it comes in really good condition. 600 watts is more than enough for this build and even gives room for upgrades in the future. Say if you wanted to throw in an 8 core Ryzen CPU and a more power hungry graphics card. The only slight downsides of this unit is the fact that it's non-modular and it doesn't have all black cables. But because of my case selection, neither of those really matter. Speaking of which, I went with a case I already had on hand. This is a Rosewill FBM series case and when I bought it a few months back, it was only $25 which was a good deal, but the price seems to have shot up a fair bit. I really like this case design, it's super minimalist and looks very clean in my opinion. Well, this case case may not be $25 anymore, the reality is at any given time you should be able to find a case for $25 or less. Newegg always has a selection of cases under $30, most of which should work fine. Obviously, you should check the dimensions of your components, but in most cases, if the case supports your motherboard, then it's going to fit the rest of your components. The two big things to look out for is cooler height clearance and graphics card length clearance. All in all, for $300, I got what is a pretty well-rounded system. It's not the prettiest build but gets the job of 1080p gaming done very well. Assembling the system went by pretty smooth, I didn't run into any major issues and it booted up right away. Cable management isn't the easiest, but again there's no side panel window, so perfect cable management isn't a requirement. So now that you've heard about all the parts and why I picked them, it's now time to talk about the benchmarks and how the system performs in games. 
But before that, I want to take a minute to talk to any of you trying to learn something new in 2020. Today's video is sponsored and made possible by the great folks over at Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for creative and curious people. They offer topics including illustration, design, photography, video, freelancing, and more. I just finished up a course from one of my favorite YouTubers, Thomas Frank, on productivity, and I have to say I've already learned so much from it and am already implementing some of the methods learned in that course. I've taken taken a few more logo design courses because I'm trying to make a new Tech by Matt logo, and I keep on finding course after course that piques my interest. Skillshare is super affordable, especially compared to in-person classes with premium costing less than $10 per month. But the cool thing is Skillshare is offering my viewers two full months of premium access risk-free so that you can get in there, try it out, and see how awesome it is. All you have to do is click the link in the description to gain access. And not only will you get free access to a great product, but signing up is a free way to support the channel because sponsors like Skillshare are the main reason I'm able to bring you all of this content. If you've been wanting to learn something like animation or music production, then there's no better time than the present and no better place than Skillshare. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to your regularly scheduled content. So going into testing, I wanted to test mostly popular titles because those are the kind of games people are going to be playing on a system like this. I did throw in a modern hard to run game though to give you an idea of how this system will perform in modern AAA titles. The games I tested include PUBG, Fortnite, CSGO, Rainbow Six Siege, and Borderlands 3. Starting off with Rainbow Six, like I said in the intro, the system puts out a nearly 200 FPS average at 1080p medium settings. This is really good performance and shows that if you need high refresh rate then the system will provide them in a game like Rainbow Six. Moving on to PUBG at 1080p medium settings, the system produced a 105 FPS average which was pretty smooth and enjoyable. Moving on to our more difficult to run game, Borderlands 3, which is very graphically intensive, the system at 1080p medium settings with the built-in benchmark provided a 72 FPS average. This was pretty smooth and I didn't see any stuttering or major FPS drops. This was pretty impressed to me that the system could handle Borderlands 3 at well above 60 FPS. Moving on to CSGO at 1080p Pro settings, the system received a 215 FPS average, which is pretty good. This should be more than adequate for competitive play, and to me it seems like a very smooth experience. Finally, for our most polarizing game, Fortnite, the system at 1080p Pro settings received a 154 FPS average. This was good to see that this PC could average over 144 FPS, and honestly, I was having some fun in this Team Rumbles match. So as you can see, for $300, this system provides some great performance for the money. If you absolutely want to go all new, you can build a gaming PC for $300, but if you're willing to buy a few of your parts used, then this video is proof that you can build a very capable 1080p gaming PC for the $300 price point. If you guys have any questions or want suggestions on parts, you can leave your questions in the comment section below, and I'll do my best to respond to as many as I can. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Make sure to click the link in the description for two months of premium access and to support the channel. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to hit the like button, consider subscribing, and as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.